you know, one of the things we talked about, uh, maybe Larry and you could talk about that, is how important you think is, you know, these doctors who talk about it are specialists, like Dr. Morse, in this disease who spent, you know, a good amount of time figuring out about this disease, what it, how the symptoms are, what are the specific symptoms, syndromes. So right, how important do you think it's, it's to see a specialist? Like you got in with Dr. Morse within a week. How important it is, do you think, for patients to kind of find out somebody who is a specialist in, in this disease? Oh, I believe it's critical. Uh, I really do. Uh, in rural areas especially, many general practitioners don't have the experience to deal with this particular type of cancer. I mean, I know this. I live in a rural area. And uh, so if, if you really want to get the treatment that you need to try to control this disease and maintain your quality of life, you need to be able to reach out to a place and to people who can offer you world-class care. Right. I what about think, you, Mary? Um, you know, I think it's true. I think uh, a lot of patients don't realize that sometimes you can go to the specialist and they will work with your local oncologist. I think that every patient at, at some point in their life needs to go and see a specialist, somebody that treats this disease. Um, because the local oncologists don't have the time. It's, it's not their fault they're treating dozens of different diseases and um, we are rare and a lot of times there may be only one or two patients that they've ever seen in their lifetime and so they really don't have the time to dedicate it. So at one point during your, your lifespan during the journey you should see a specialist and, and then have them work with your local oncologist and get the treatment that you deserve. Like Larry said, he probably knew more about his disease than some of the doctors he saw. Now Dr. Morris, that brings up a very important point. Not everybody uh, can go to Duke. You know, everybody can just get up and say, I'm driving to Duke. They could be living hours away, not in the same state, uh, because there are not many doctors like you <laughs> around. So do you, do you communicate with the community on college? Is that fairly common? How, how, do, you, how do you kind of deal with this uh, situation for this special disease? Um, right. There's, uh, <clears throat> there's many opportunities for us to uh, help out local oncologists. Uh, often people will come even if it's for one visit so we can understand their unique case and what issues are critical to focus on in them. Uh, but many times people take the rest of their care until there's a, a new juncture in their disease with their local oncologist. Um, I think there are some areas that we can in particular point out that people aren't always aware of. Uh, some of the symptoms or long-term complications like carcinoid heart disease, for example. Um, it's not something that people necessarily think about. We, we focus on this as being a, a GI tract disease and prominent diarrhea and the flushing, but silently can be valve Hitting damage going on. Wow, that's yeah, and people, I, I've serious. even seen people near the time of diagnosis who already had some element of valvular damage and, and didn't know it, and they weren't quite symptomatic enough where somebody would think about their heart. So that's a scenario where we can make a recommendation, well, make sure the person has an echocardiogram at baseline, or make sure it's checked periodically. Um, and to check on the heart, to check on the valves, uh, what kind of symptoms do people have if they have this uh, heart valve disease from this disease? Well, first of all, we, we hope people don't get to the point of being symptomatic. Symptomatic means typically the valves on the right side of the heart, the tricuspid and the pulmonic valve are the ones that are affected. And if they're severely damaged and scarred up, you have what's called valvular regurgitation. Blood goes in the wrong direction when the heart is pumping. And so typically people have exercise intolerance. They just can't do the activities that they normally could. They start swelling uh, because the blood's not being pumped forward as efficiently. It's a sting in the legs. And it's yeah, in the legs, uh, in the belly, around, around the lungs. The, the point is people uh, don't get adequate forward blood flow and so it backs up, so to speak. And it uh, can severely affect quality of life and eventually can be lethal if the right side of the heart eventually fails. We, we obviously want to get to people before that happens. In some cases, people need valve replacements. And um, if somebody has had a valve replacement, it's important to protect that valve so they don't need another valve replacement in the future. So uh, what we currently do is uh, try to get an understanding of how much serotonin the person is making. We talked earlier that although you can measure serotonin levels in the bloodstream, it can be it, it, it can, they can fluctuate uh, yeah. quite a bit. 
and uh, the, the better test is, a, is the metabolic breakdown product of serotonin, 5-HIAA. Only for a urine, yeah? Peacock. Correct. Typically, yeah. typically done in the urine. There is a way of doing it in the blood now, but most people have it done in the urine. And if we find people have particularly high levels, uh, and, and even if they're already on a, a somatostatin analog at that point, we take that very seriously because the very high levels are associated with a greater risk of having carcinoid valve damage. And uh, fortunately, we um, you know, can measure that. We can do the echocardiograms and decide if we need to intervene to you know, try to control their serotonin more or make sure they're seeing a cardiologist to understand when you know, valve replacement may be an issue. So a lot of little nuances. You know, it's like kind of you know, it's a kind of disease, a syndrome, but there are a lot of little, and, and it seems like this is truly every patient is unique in this. Uh, Larry was unique. Ryan, you're unique in, in the, your symptoms. So That's um, one of the reasons why we chose the zebra as our logo and um, as our awareness, because um, no two zebras have the same stripes. And a lot of people believe that in medical school, the doctors are taught when hearing hoofbeat, think of horses, not zebras. Look mm -hmm. for the common, not the uncommon. It's very easy for the doctors to assume that when you're having a lot of diarrhea or anything like that, the first thing they say is IBS. It's easy. Um, but we're uncommon. And the second reason is because no two zebras have the same stripes, and there is no two net patients or carcinoid patients that are exactly the same. We all respond differently. We all have different symptoms. It's not a cut and dry situation. Um, like most cancers, um, you know, after five years, you're either gone or you're released from your oncologist. You are a lifetime patient with this. And, you know, there's many of us that are out there 15, 20, 30 years. Right. And so it, a lot of times it's treated as a chronic disease, but there is so many facets to this disease, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. It's very frustrating sometimes for the patient and as well as for the doctor. So when they call you at night, is it mostly patients who've been diagnosed or somebody who's having the symptoms and they go, well, I'm not really sure what I, what I have? Um, I would say 90% of our calls are from patients that are already diagnosed and are concerned. Um, and I would say 10% of the time we do get calls from people who say, you know, my doctors have exhausted everything and they're saying they're not really sure what it is. Um, could you get me, give me a list of what blood works I should be getting done? Maybe we can pick up something soon. Um, and so we do. And I always encourage patients that if they're going for the colonoscopy to go ahead and get a pediatric scope. <laughs> pediatric scope. <laughs> because, um, do you the know, big one, but do the small one, definitely. You know, I, I'm very grateful for my uh, GI doctor because if he had not, I'd, I really don't know where I would be today. And um, he, since he has found mine, he has found six other patients using the pediatric scope wow. in the last 16 years. So it does work.